So Russia, Ukraine, and the United States response. By now, I'm sure that you've heard that something is going on, something pretty significant, to put it lightly. And I honestly, uh, I don't know where to begin here. Do I start with a history lesson? Do I supply you with the context of the geopolitical situation in Eastern Europe over the past five years? I don't know. This is tough. This is really complicated. And anyone who claims that they're an authority on this issue, unless they have a PhD in political science and Russian history and Eastern European history, I don't think that they are an authority on this issue. And what's difficult is that we are working with um, a situation where two competing imperial powers are purposefully spreading disinformation to muddy the water. So you could read an article that sounds pretty impartial, but yet it's written by someone with an interest who's representing a particular point of view. So it's difficult to be someone who finds objective information when you don't really know how to decipher between the bullshit and the correct, objective, impartial information. So not really knowing how to approach this, the solution that I came up with is to just do a generic listicle. And I know that that's not the best solution here, but if I just give you five things that I know for sure and give you an objectively good takeaway, in my opinion, I think that that is probably the best way to approach this, although it's, it's admittedly imperfect. So the first thing that you absolutely must know about the situation is that you don't know shit, and neither do I. Reading an article or two, watching a YouTube video about this does not make you an expert on the subject. I'll say it again. Reading an article or two and watching a YouTube video with some dickhead know-it-all does not make you an expert on this subject. It is not an adequate substitute for real knowledge here. There are a lot of things at play, and the reason why it's so difficult to obtain accurate information here, as I stated, is because of the disinformation campaigns. On one hand, the United States, I don't trust them because this is a country that has been militaristic and aggressive throughout my entire life. We have a military industrial complex that at this point is almost semi-autonomous, and is always going to err on the side of militarism. So whatever our government officials say, I'm skeptical. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that I trust Vladimir Putin. When he says that he's not going to invade Ukraine, do I believe him? Absolutely not. Would he even possibly do a false flag attack in Ukraine to kind of use that as the catalyst to justify an invasion into Ukraine? Oh, sure, I wouldn't put it past him. I don't trust anyone here. So what I'm trying to do is look out for the human species. And even with that, you know, <laughs> really a bold uh, goal here, you know, there are pitfalls that you can easily fall in. So just know that everything that I say in this video, everything that anyone says, take it all with a grain of salt. Use that as a jumping point to educate yourself. But as you pursue information be careful because you could inadvertently stumble upon misinformation everything here needs to be rigorously you know vetted it's this is really really difficult so just remember you don't know shit we can try to figure out what's going on and be as objective as possible but there are limits to that given what's at stake and how many competing narratives are out there now another issue is that the mainstream media has not been trustworthy Case in point, should the U.S. rattle Putin's cage, published in Politico and presented by Lockheed Martin? Not necessarily a source I trust, given that conflict of interest. And then on top of that, you have Joe Scarborough and his right-wing colleagues implying that the U.S. is seen as weak globally. Therefore, the implication is that maybe we shouldn't be so weak. Maybe we should be a little bit more aggressive. He says the Russians see our retreat from Afghanistan as a green light to invade Ukraine. China sees American passivity toward Ukraine as a green light to invade Taiwan. So do you understand the problem here? There are people who have an agenda. Basically, everyone in mainstream media, conservative, liberals, they're going to be beating the war drums. They do this in every single instance of there being a foreign policy issue, be it uh, China, Venezuela, Iran. This is just what they do. So you, you have to be very careful in the information that you come across and verify it before you repeat it. And be very careful even repeating anything that you hear about this, including from me, because even if I'm trying to do my best, again, I can make a mistake that could lead to you being, you know, um, misled, which is not what I want to do. 
Uh, so that brings us to point number two. War with Russia is unquestionably out of the question, and anyone who suggests otherwise is psychopathic. Now, that might sound like hyperbole, but I need you to understand what's at stake here. The United States and Russia are both nuclear powers. So a war with them over Ukraine, not only is this not in the interest of the American people and the Russian people and the Ukrainian people, it's not in the interest of humanity itself because nuclear war is something that could literally end life on this planet. And in an op-ed for the Washington Post, Bronco Marsetic writes, if U.S.-Russian hostilities led to the use of nukes, it wouldn't end well. Imagine if the web of alliances that led to crisscrossing declarations of war in 1914 had triggered hundreds, maybe thousands of nuclear warheads being fired across continents instead. The United States, whose missile defense systems have a far from 100% success rate, would not escape unscathed. And even if a ground war managed to avoid triggering a nuclear holocaust, it would still precipitate an economic downturn, considering Europe's dependence on Russian natural gas and the costs accrued from U.S. wars against weaker countries than Russia. Ukraine, on whose behalf war hawks would risk such disaster, is a country 5,700 miles away from American shores, and one that, as a non-NATO member, Remember, Washington has no obligation to defend. Its government and security forces are also infected with neo-Nazis who have trained and directly inspired homegrown far-right terrorists. If you're reading this from one of the dozens of major metropolitan and military centers that would sit in the crosshairs of a Russian nuclear attack, ask yourself, is Ukraine's territorial integrity really worth the costs? And the answer is no. Now, it's easy to kind of get bogged down by all of this and just think... You know, from a strategic perspective, okay, if they do this, we obviously have to respond this way. If they do X, we do Y. But understand what's happening here. We're not just talking about pieces on a chessboard. We're talking about the lives of human beings. So, of course, we absolutely, under no circumstances, can have a hot war with Russia. Now, pundits on mainstream media will imply that we're obligated to defend Ukraine in the event Russia does invade. But that's not true. We absolutely fucking have a choice. When we're facing the prospect of war between two competing nuclear powers, we absolutely have a choice. And the only thing that we should be considering is how do we preserve life on this planet because a nuclear war would not be in the interest of the human species. And I don't give a fuck about what the U.S. government says. I don't care about the way that they'll look if they don't intervene in the event Russia does invade. I don't care about Russia's geopolitical interests. I couldn't care less about any of that bullshit. What I care about is preserving this fucking planet for all of us human beings to live on perpetually. If we lived in a sane world, all nuclear powers would come together and get rid of every single nuclear warhead in existence in the mutual interest of preserving the human race, but that's not happening. So all of humanity has to watch in horror as leaders of global superpowers play chicken with each other in a deadly dick measuring contest which is bound to get us all killed at some point in time. It's fucking insane. So yes, we do have a choice, and diplomacy is the only option, and if diplomacy fails, then you take the L and you, you move on. You can't invade. You can't have a hot war with Russia. What the fuck are we thinking? Why is this even on anyone's brains as a possibility? Now, to be fair, diplomatic talks between the United States and Russia are ongoing, but if this fails, this does not justify war. If Russia invades Ukraine, that would be catastrophic, and that still would not justify war. Nothing would justify war between two nuclear powers. I shouldn't have to say this. That's not to say that a Russian invasion into Ukraine wouldn't be catastrophic for the people of Ukraine, especially if Putin decides to annex regions of Ukraine that aren't ethnically Russian. But as bad as that would be, it would be orders of magnitude worse if this devolved into a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Therefore, we'd have to make a utilitarian calculation. It's Ukraine or everyone else. And I choose everyone else. I choose everyone on the planet. We're talking about life on Earth here. We're talking about the prospect of nuclear war. Wake the fuck up, people. Why are you even thinking this is an option? Whoever thinks this is an option is unironically psychopathic. Now, that's reductionist, admittedly so. But the prospect of war with Russia, all because these dumb fuck leaders of both countries think that they're justified in doing this. No, it's not. Life on this planet is what matters the most, and we have to do everything in our fucking power to preserve life on this planet. But it seems like human beings are on a fucking extinction speed run lately, and the fact that this is even being considered and championed in mainstream media is just truly 
insane. And I'm going to be using that adjective quite a bit, but it's the only thing that's appropriate for this situation. Nuclear war? Do you all really want to live in that world where we're seeing a nuclear holocaust, where we're worrying once again, like, you know, the Cold War before, if we're going to be nuked? Who wants to live in that world? I mean, people, we have to get our shit together as a species. We're killing the planet. I mean, is it really going to come down to what kills us first? The unhabitability of our planet or nuclear war? Is that really the world that we want to live in? Because I sure the fuck don't. I actually want to live. I want future generations to be able to thrive on this planet. So fuck your war. Fuck the prospect of war. Fuck the interests of all of these superpowers. We need to live. Now, I understand if we do nothing, if Russia does indeed invade Ukraine, the fear then becomes, well, what if Russia starts going after other countries? You know, if it's Ukraine, do they just stop there? Of course not. And this fear, however warranted it may be, it kind of dismisses the reality of the global situation currently. Russia, as big as they may be, they're still not the global hegemonic power. It's the United States. We are the ones who keep expanding. We are the ones who keep invading other countries, which brings me to point three, which is we keep antagonizing Russia and escalating. And we're doing this instead of trying to pursue diplomatic options, trying to hear Russia out, trying to be reasonable in our response. All that we know is aggression. And that's the only thing that we keep doing rather than trying soft diplomacy for once where we offer to ease sanctions if Russia decides to withdraw troops from Ukraine's border. This is what we're doing instead. As Sarah Sirota explains, House Dems want to expedite a floor vote on a massive Ukraine defense bill that would dramatically increase U.S. security assistance and lay groundwork for major sanctions on Russia hastening a much more aggressive posture without much room for debate. So when you do things like this, you don't really leave room for diplomatic talks to flourish. Additionally, Biden was at least considering sending troops to Ukraine to defend against the Russian invasion, and his administration claims that it's imminent. And as a result, currently 8,500 troops were on standby. Although I say were because he seemingly ruled this out when talking to the press earlier today. There is not going to be any American forces moving into Ukraine. So that's a genuinely positive development, but things can change and they do tend to change and understand that Biden, as reasonable as he's being right there, at least he has a lot of voices in his ear, always constantly pushing for antagonism. You're weak, you're weak, you're weak. Be stronger, be stronger. Remember Afghanistan and how weak you are. Be tough. So, you know, because he's saying this now doesn't mean that the situation won't change. And as a result, you know, he changes his mind as a consequence, which moves us to the fourth thing that I think you should know. The world is not black and white. It's not just that Vladimir Putin is the villain and we're the good guys or that we're the villains and Vladimir Putin is the good guy. Things are a lot more complicated than that. In truth, we're all villains, we're all evil, and whenever one side does something, it's usually in response to the other's aggression. So in an article for Jacobin, Bronco Marsetic breaks this down. In fact, Putin's highly publicized provocations against Washington are responses to far less publicized U.S. actions and vice versa, part of a tit-for-tat exchange between two adversarial powers. The solar winds hack of April, suspected to have been carried out by Russia, was the last of these. But before that, Washington carried out a hack and dump operation against the Russian company working for intelligence services. Of course, before that was Russia's infamous 2016 election interference, also allegedly involving the hack and release of embarrassing documents, which itself was a response to Washington's democracy promotion work in Russia, which Putin not unreasonably views with suspicion. It's worth noting that in May, U.S. officials were tricked into admitting on camera that they have a very, very active program throughout Russia and were targeting the country's legislative elections, meaning this political meddling, the likes of which Americans would justify balk at if it was revealed Beijing or Moscow was doing the same thing within U.S. borders is still going on. And it would be naive to assume that there isn't some Russian version of this going on within the United States, even if it's not on the same scale. You can go back throughout history like this and Washington and Moscow would each point the finger claiming the other started it, whose right doesn't matter for now. The point is that Russia has not been some supreme evil testing the United States unprovoked, but has instead been engaging in a pretty standard to and fro with a geopolitical rival. Now, this right here characterizes the back and forth between Russia and the United States over the course of the last few years. But you have to go back a little bit further to really understand what's happening here. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, at that point, NATO was effectively meaningless. 
Once the Soviet Union collapsed, the need for NATO was over. But for whatever reason, after promising to not expand eastward, between 1999 and 2020, there were 14 new countries that were added to NATO, all of them Eastern European countries. So when you have the prospect of Ukraine joining NATO, Russia justifiably sees that as a threat. And Russia sees this as a threat because of the large border they share with Ukraine. Quote, Putin has given the side eye to this expansion for a while, but the inclusion of Ukraine would be a step further. Not only does the country share a far larger land border with Russia than any existing NATO member state, but there has always been a powerful contingent within the country that sees Ukraine as fundamentally part of Russia, or at least as a younger sibling. There is, in other words, a lot of national pride tied up in the matter for Russia, as well as considerable security concerns. Just imagine if Russia or China looked to add Mexico to a military alliance of Latin American states they headed, placing troops and weapons just over the fence from Texas. Though the United States and NATO have always insisted the alliance isn't directed against Russia, Moscow is understandably not convinced. After all, the Clinton administration itself justified expanding NATO by warning of the need to be on guard for the possibility that Russia could return to the threatening behavior of the Soviet period and Putin's early suggestion to let Russia join NATO, albeit while jump in queue or create a european wide security pact was rebuffed now i think this is an important mental exercise here imagine if that was the case if russia was trying to create some sort of alliance in latin america to you know um stifle u.s aggression which has been a thing in latin america for those of you who don't know and then they decided to expand to mexico a country that borders the united states what would our psychopathic leaders do how would they respond I don't think it would be a question. They would bomb Russia. It would be an outright hot war. And furthermore, imagine if Vladimir Putin backed a coup in Mexico, the ouster of, you know, a government that was favorable to the U.S. in favor of a government that was more sympathetic towards Russian interests. I mean, in 2014, we did this in Ukraine. We backed the ouster of someone who was more favorable to the Kremlin. So imagine if Russia did that. So in order to try to understand the motivations of a global rival, you have to try to get into their head and see what's happening. And as you can see, you know, there has been repeated aggression and escalations from the United States. That doesn't mean that Putin is the victim, but you have to understand that the world is in black and white. It's not just that everything Putin does is a provocation. Oftentimes it's a response. And what we do, we can view that as a response too to Putin's aggressions. But either way, the world isn't a black and white thing. And you know, if people try to propagate this myth that the world is black and white and we only have binary choices to make and it's this way or that way, they're wrong. Now, let's get to the final thing that you need to know about this particular issue. At least as of right now, based on an ABC News report published less than two hours ago from the time that I record this, Ukraine does not believe a Russian invasion is imminent. Now, Russia does have 100,000 troops near the Ukraine border, and yes, that's alarming. An invasion would be absolutely devastating, but let's try to bring it down, right? Ukraine wouldn't say, we don't believe an invasion is imminent if that weren't the case. I mean, if they believed that an invasion from Russia was imminent, they'd probably say that. On top of that, thinking about Russia, they know that the economic sanctions that would be imposed at a minimum would cripple their economy, which is already in shambles. So they have an interest to not invade, aside from, you know, the history and him maybe wanting to reignite the Soviet Union. Either way, there are a lot of things that lead to him not wanting to make this decision doesn't mean that he's not going to make it but there's you know a lot of factors at play here that make it not necessarily a certainty that an invasion will occur and i'm saying this because i want you to bring it down calm down it's very easy to become doom and gloom when you know we we talk about these things that could result in nuclear war, a nuclear holocaust. But understand that this rivalry between the United States and Russia is nothing new. It might be new for our generation, but our parents and grandparents, they grew up with this. My mom, for example, she grew up in Hawaii and they had drills in school to get under the tables, hide in the event of, you know, a nuclear war. We don't have to deal with that today. So let's let's calm down. This is nothing new. Let's not assume the worst. Let's not unnecessarily catastrophize. Let's try to live our lives 
and chill. I think that's really important because oftentimes these emotions can lead us to making irrational decisions. These emotions can lead us to, you know, finding a source, an article, you know, somebody on YouTube who just tells us what makes sense when we can't really make sense of things when, when we're in this state of panic. So it's very important that we relax. And notice how I'm even using a more calm tone to bring it all down after talking about this catastrophic issue. But it's important. You know, it's concerning but as individuals, there's not much that we can do. So it is absolutely not beneficial to us to freak out about this. It's worrying. Absolutely. I grant you that. I'm worried about this. But let's chill and acknowledge that if this is okay, if if they don't invade and situations kind of, you know, improves, if, if tensions are eased, then in a few months, who knows? There could be the prospect of war with Iran it's just this is always going to be a thing so we have to find ways to cope with these types of details and, and stories when they're so common you can't let this you know pollute your brain you can't let this get you down and affect your mood and make you depressed really really important so that's what i want to leave you with and just remember once again you don't know shit and neither do i so everything that i've told you here vet it you can check out the articles that I've listed in the description box that I've used to kind of guide my assessment, but understand that it's very, very difficult to ascertain objective and impartial details about the situation given the current state of media and the disinformation campaigns being waged by the United States and Russia and their, their allies in, in media. So it's, it's hard to know. Just know that one objective takeaway that I think everyone can agree with who's reasonable is that a war with Russia, even the thought of war with Russia, is totally out of the question. It's something that we have to unequivocally rule out. And that's because we are focused on the higher goal of preserving life on this planet, which to me is a little bit important. So, yeah, that's what I've got for you. I have no idea if this was satisfactory. I have no idea if this was helpful. Perhaps you find it helpful, but some of the details here aren't explained carefully. Either way, just be careful here, folks, when we're, when we're looking at details as it relates to this issue.